Good afternoon to all our attendees. Some reminders before we start. First, we would like to inform you that this session is being recorded. Second, kindly put your audio on mute during the discussion. Only the audio of the resource speakers and the moderator will be operational. Third, in your Zoom profile name, please rename it to your name and agency. Fourth, please write your questions in the Zoom chat box. Questions will be entertained during the open forum. And last, certificate of attendance will be given once you accomplish the online webinar evaluation form. We will be posting the link in the chat box later. Thank you so much. Magandang hapon, maayong hapon, marhay na hapon, and good afternoon to our over 100 participants here with us on Zoom today, including our esteemed resource speakers, 
guests and participants from different local government units, different national government agencies, and eager stakeholders across the country. I am Cha Makiraya, live from DAP Pasig, your host for this eDecalogo webinar series entitled Empowering Your Community, How Local Government Can Lead the Way in Energy Efficiency and Conservation. We are delighted to see participants from different government agencies and institutions all over the country coming to our webinar. Thank you for your time to be part of this activity. We'd like to know, Muna, where our participants are right now? Kindly where, uh, comment in the Zoom chat box your location and the status of the weather in your area or what it feels like in your area today. Okay, let me see. Okay, cuddle. Okay. <laughs> Kaba na tuan? Okay, so we have rain. Kainta, rainy, yes. 10 degrees and sunny. South Africa. Okay, we have from... It's a strategic Friday, yes. Okay, so we Gaya want puni. our participants to be conscious with their mics. And wow. We have representatives from Luzon, Visayas, Mindanao, and we have one participant outside the country. Ayan. Thank you, Dr. Sunny. Ayan. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much to all our attendees who answered. We hope you are all excited for today's e-decalogo hosted by the Development Academy of the Philippines Graduate School of Public and Development Management. To officially welcome all of us, may we call on the Dean of the DAP Graduate School of Public and Development Management, Dr. Lizanne E. Perante Kalina. Uh, Dean Lizanne is currently up in the north to be with our health officers for a program to, unfortunately, they have unstable internet connection there. So we opted to record Dean's welcome speech for all of us. Hi, everyone. Welcome to E. Decalago. This is another edifying discussion on the topic, empowering your community, how local government can lead the way in energy efficiency and conservation. Before we start, I'd like to recognize our resource persons under Secretary Felix William Fentevalia of the Department of Energy, Dr. Ricardo Barcelona, Energy Advisor, Director Patrick Aquino, Energy Utilization Management Bureau of the Department of Energy, the Honorable Mayor Jeremy Rosario from LGU Manawag Pangasinan, Engineer Arvin Kamad of Quezon City, Government, Architect Abraham Rapazan of LGU Mandaluyong, and of course to our reactors later, Dr. Asher Javier, Local Government Consultant, Mr. Leon Still, and Engineer JJ Gonzalez, and to our moderator, Dr. Malu Rebelida. So again, to our distinguished experts and resource persons, energy efficiency and conservation practitioners, my dear friends from the local government units and other government agencies, Good afternoon and welcome to the DAP Graduate School, the academic arm of the Development Academy of the Philippines. We are here to ardently respond to the needs of the Philippine bureaucracy, the private sector, and different civil society organizations by providing them with top-notch capacity building programs focused on evidence-based approaches, innovative methodologies, and strategies grounded both on theoretical and practical perspectives that they can bring to their institutions. The Caligo is the graduate school's main platform, which is the main reason is to deepen public management and governance discourse. It is a free public lecture series where we invite experts, professors, researchers, and practitioners and luminaries to discuss and exchange insights with our stakeholders on interesting topics with the aim to impart valuable lessons on good governance characterized by ethical leadership, patriotism, integrity, and professionalism. 
The DAP as a government think tank and training institution believes in the importance of building partnerships and engaging in the process of achieving sustainable development goals. These goals are interrelated to one another in such a way that any progress we've made in one of the SDGs will pave the way toward the achievement of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. In response to this universal call to action, the Philippines integrates these agendas into its various sectoral developments, such as in the energy sector through laws and practices that promote the efficient use of energy resource at the community level. The goal is to achieve sustainable development goal number seven, which is to ensure access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all with targets on universal access, renewable energy, and energy efficiency. We in the DAP Graduate School believe that harnessing present day ideas, collaborating with different stakeholders, and producing events such as Edicaligo will serve as a stepping stone to different generations in promoting sustainable energy in the future. Through collaborating, we can initiate a dialogue that will, of course, draft suitable policy recommendations to conserve energy and promote energy efficiency. By this, proper strategies may be manifested and be able to produce a resilient society that is able to contribute to reducing fuel import dependence that ensures the mitigation of climate change. That is why the Graduate School initiates this edicologo with the help of the Department of Energy, energy experts and consultants who serve as our resource persons to share some international energy practices and developments, discuss the key provisions of the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Act and how these provisions apply to our local government units. This webinar titled The Caligo serves as a platform to identify challenges opportunities and solutions in implementing Republic Act number 11285, focusing on energy efficiency and conservation from national to local levels. Individually, we have the responsibility to efficiently use energy and fuel resources and conserve them. We must be able to discern and act on how much energy we need to consume, but as an institution, we even have a greater responsibility and moral obligation as well, which comes with equally greater accountability to inform the public and instigate a change where we focus more on sustainable development and secure futures. I hope this ED Caliber session marks the beginning of your commitment to taking the lead and contributing to a better future for ourselves and the next generation. Enjoy the webinar. Maraming salamat, Hiraya Manuari. Thank you, Dean Lizan, for welcoming all of the speakers and participants to our eDecalogo. To start our eDecalogo, our first resource speaker will discuss the energy perspectives on sustainable development goals. He is the current Undersecretary for Power, Renewable Energy, Media Affairs, and spokesperson of the Department of Energy. He hails from Camarines Sur, where he served as the Congressman of the 4th Legislative District. As a member of the House of Representatives, he pursued several bills, including the Anti-Money Laundering Act and amendments to the Procurement Act. Ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to have today under Secretary Felix William Wimpy Fuentebels. Good afternoon, sir. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. First, I would like to express our gratitude to the Development Academy of the Philippines for the opportunity to be here to give a short talk on the Philippine Energy Plan and its thrust towards achieving the Sustainable Development Goal on Affordable and Clean Energy, or SDG 7. Our current energy system 
has often been identified as one of the leading causes of the climate crisis. The government and the private sector needs to make strategic choices that will determine the future well-being of our Filipino people and the environment of the generations to come. The Philippine Energy Plan 2020 to 2040 stands as a testament to our bold ambitions and unwavering commitments in transforming our energy landscape. It emphasizes the changes in the energy choices as well as behavioral transformation in terms of promoting an energy efficient lifestyle. At its core, the Philippine Energy Plan serves as the roadmap of the programs and projects that will help ensure sustainable, stable, secure, sufficient, accessible, and reasonably priced energy. It speaks of the clean energy scenario that is built upon the pillars of pursuing energy security and sustainability, developing resilient infrastructures, creating a competitive energy sector, building of smart homes, and empowering consumers. To drive our transition to clean energy, the Philippine Energy Plan articulates specific targets such as 1. Attaining the target of at least 35% renewable energy share in the power generation mix by 2030 and 50% by 2040. 2. Reducing energy intensity and consumption per year vis-a-vis -vis the business as usual. Three reaching the 10% penetration rate of electric vehicles by 2040, and four, achieving a 5% energy savings on oil and electricity by 2040. Please take note that all these are conservative numbers, and in the upcoming update of the Philippine Energy Plan, we will have bolder ambitions. So in realizing these targets, we cite some of the developments and what we have been up to in transitioning to a clean energy future on innovating our renewable energy choices. We encourage the use of renewable energy in agriculture, fisheries, health, and education sectors. For one, we have demonstration projects on solar-powered abaca, spindle machine, solar-powered corn miller, and solar-powered vaccine refrigerator. These innovative technologies not only promote renewable energy, but also provide credible income generating possibilities for our community, communities, especially the remote areas. We have also launched the US Philippines Offshore Wind Development Partnership as the country continues to access and develop all potential indigenous energy sources to diversify the country's energy supply mix. Corollary to offshore wind, President Marcos Jr. recently signed Executive Order 21 Series of 2023. This executive order directs the Department of Energy to develop and issue a policy and administrative framework for the optimal development of the offshore wind resources in the country. It also states the integration into the energy virtual one-stop shop system by its permitting processes by the concerned agencies. To date, the government has awarded 65 offshore wind contracts with an aggregate pot capacity of 51 gigawatts. The offshore wind roadmap for the Philippines was published last year, serving as the overarching framework for future offshore wind projects. This undertaking was made possible through the general support of our development partners, resulting in the identification of 178 gigawatts of offshore wind potential across the country, particularly in the areas of Northwest Luzon, Manila, Mindoro, Guimara Strait, Negros Panay West. And in fact, one of the bigger projects in offshore in, is in offshore Ilocos by uh, Buhawin Energy Philippines, a joint venture between Danish Copenhagen Energy and Filipino Petrogreen Energy Corporation. 
companies with an indicative potential of 1.65 to 2.2 gigawatts of installed capacity for the first stage. To further accelerate and steer the RE development, the Department of Energy also issued the notice of auction for the second green energy auction to be held in June this year, where 11.6 gigawatts of RE capacity is being offered. The annual renewable energy capacity offered are the following. 3.6 gigawatts for 2024, 3.6 gig, gigawatts for 2025, and 4.4 gigawatts for 2026. Solar projects will be providing most of the installations at 7.62 gigawatts or 66% of the total, while onshore wind projects are expected to add 3.72 gigawatts of capacity. Most importantly, we issued a policy in November 2022 allowing 100% foreign ownership on renewable energy exploration and development projects. Foreign-owned entities are now allowed to engage in the exploration, development, and utilization of indigenous renewable energy resources such as solar, wind, biomass, and ocean or tidal energy. We are also exploring the introduction of more hybrid systems in the off-grid areas. These systems combine the use of renewable energy sources such as solar or wind power with traditional diesel generators to produce electricity, hybrid systems offer more sustainable and efficient approach approaches by reducing the dependency on diesel alone, which can be costly and environmentally damaging. By integrating RE into the power generation mix, off-grid areas can benefit from the cleaner and more reliable energy sources. We also have the continued implementation of the competitive selection process, which provides for the conduct of clear, transparent, and fair supply procurement process that will promote competition and greater private sector participation in the provision of least cost, reliable, and adequate supply of electricity. It addresses the power supply contacting of the electric power utilities, serving both on-grid and off-grid areas in the country. We also have the promotion of the energy efficient way of life. Energy is a fundamental requirement for human existence comparable to essential needs for food and water. It plays a critical role in the economic development and overall societal progress. These are basic realities in our modern world. More than ever, we need to reduce our demand, which is a key driver of increasing greenhouse gas emissions. Intensifying efforts on the energy efficiency and conservation, as well as the use of alternative fuels and technologies are important measures not only to reduce our energy demand, but to rebuild a greener and vibrant economy. In this aspect, the Department of Energy has the following initiatives. One, the passage of Renewable Energy of Republic Act um, 11285 or the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Act, coupled with the Renewable Energy Act of 2020 of 2008. The government sector leads the way in promoting energy efficiency in the way it uses electricity and fuel. The implementation of the government energy management program from 2019 to the present has generated energy savings of 12.3 gigawatt hours of electricity or 122.8 million pesos and 127,203 liters of gasoline and diesel. These save the country a valuable foreign exchange as well as that displaced, as well as displaced the need for additional power generating plants. We also have the passage of renewable and uh, of RA 11697 or the Electric Vehicle Industry Development Act. This actively calls for the development and utilization of alternative and emerging fuels and technologies. Under this policy, the comprehensive roadmap for electric vehicle industry will serve 
as a national strategy to accelerate the development, commercialization, and utilization of electric vehicles. The roadmap sets a minimum of 10% target of electric vehicle share in vehicle fleet by 2040 under the business as usual scenario. While, as mentioned earlier, we are promoting the clean energy scenario that sets for a more ambitious target from 10% to 50% of all vehicle fleets by 2040. Moving forward in our quest for a green energy future, the Department of Energy is keen on the development of other cleaner sources of energy, such as hydrogen and ammonia fuels. These emerging technologies have the potential of being locally produced, both from RE and conventional sources. Along with these efforts, the department has created the Hydrogen and Fusion Energy Committee in November 2020 to explore hydrogen as a viable alternative and cleaner source of energy in its other beneficial applications for the country. And as we accelerate our transition to renewable energy and efficient energy efficient systems, we must ensure that said transition is fair and just. This means assisting displaced workers of communities hosting fossil-based energy projects through job reskilling, strengthening of social protection, and access to green investments. Meanwhile, at the recently concluded 10th Asia-Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development in Bangkok, Thailand, held in March 2023, the United Nations emphasized that the world is significantly far from achieving the goals at the current rate of progress. This is concerning. In critical areas like uh, climate action, it was highlighted that we are regressing rather than moving forward, leaving communities and economies constantly vulnerable. Additionally, Without the sustainable change in the Asia-Pacific region, the chances of achieving SDGs will diminish rapidly. To overcome these challenges, governments need, uh, need to refocus on the fundamental principles. One, safeguarding our people, particularly those marginalized. Two, promoting gender equality. Three, building resilient economies. And four, preserving our planet. In essence, the 10th Asia-Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development provided a platform for sharing knowledge, experiences, and innovative solutions to expedite sustainable development in the region. The Philippine delegation, along with the heads of states and government, actively engaged in regional discussion to take decisive actions and contribute to, that, to attaining the global climate targets. Going forward, the Philippine government will continue to actively engage in climate conversations, fostering regional collaboration, and prioritizing areas such as SDG implementation, resiliency, green economy, digital transformation, and youth and gender empowerment. Through these efforts, the Philippines can play a crucial role in advancing sustainable development agendas in shaping an inclusive and sustainable future for the region. As we conclude the talk, uh, let us iterate that as we pursue the realization of the sustainable development goal on clean and affordable energy, we need to act with urgency. We have to be ambitious and we need to collaborate. By doing so, we will be able to bring in real uh, the real and positive changes and step up to our goals towards providing a sustainable energy for the future. Therefore, we need to unite our efforts and seize the opportunity to drive the momentum of change. Together, we can create a better future and reap the benefit of our collective actions. Thank you. Maraming salamat po. Thank you so much, Yusek Wimpy, for giving us an in overview of the energy perspective on sustainable development goals. Just mabalos po sa imo.
The second part of the discussion is about the dynamic decisions and development and how this could be applied by our local executives, legislators, and implementers of the EEC Act. Our research speaker authored two groundbreaking books, which is the Energy Investments and Dynamic Decisions. Energy Investments values renewables as real options on their interacting energy portfolios. And his latest book, Dynamic Decisions, recognizes how imperfect humans could orchestrate resilience in firms to achieve a sustainable and profitable future. Through his research and interactions with academic businesses and policy experts, he contributes to conversations around energy transitions and sustainability, decisions under uncertainties, and how imperfect humans creatively reshape their businesses and society. His insights benefit from his academic rigor, senior leadership experiences at Shell, PLC, Led Netherlands, and London, and as a banker at the City of London. As an investment banker, he was consist consistently voted the top-rated equity analyst and advisor for European utilities. He obtained his PhD in management from King's, Lon King's College, London, MBA from IESE Business School in Spain, and bachelor's degree from School of Economics, University of the Philippines. Colleagues and participants, let's all welcome Energy Transition author and advisor, Dr. Ricardo Barcelona. Doc Rick, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, Under Secretary Fandabella has given us a, a very comprehensive view of what sustainability means and what uh, the future would look like uh, with a greater integration of renewable energy in the energy mix of the Philippines. Yeah. So let's go back. Let's go back in time. And I'd like to share a number of the conversations that I have with, uh, with Dean Lisan. Yeah. So when, uh, when I had a first conversation with, with Dean Lisan, let's go first to slide number. Uh, slide slide number two. Yeah. So when I had a first conversation with Din Lisan, it reminded me of some of the motivations for writing dynamic decisions in the first place. Yeah. I think I was rather intrigued by one phenomenon that I have observed with decision making. Imperfect humans seems to assume that one has the capacity to project what the future would look like, and therefore has the capacity to project and estimate what the payoff would look like in a very uncertain uh, environment. And as a result of that, one makes commitments that are rigid and often irreversible. So the result of that is, in most cases, what we expected as imperfect humans with some presumed omniscience of what the future would look like is actually an erroneous commitment that tends to be rigid. And at the same time, by being rigid, when things turn out against our expectation, losses are, uh, losses are incurred. So this leads me to think about what are some of the missing elements that dynamic decisions could actually introduce or could actually remedy? Well, one of these is the mindset, the mindset that people or imperfect humans trying to navigate into an uncertain future would need to adapt. And that mindset essentially has to do with- the Recording ability. in progress. <laughs> it's the ability to change course when new information warrants a change in direction. By being able to change or adopt a flexible managerial approach to committing to uh, obligations for the future, then adverse consequences can be avoided by planning for contingencies. Yeah. 
and more importantly, by having the humility to know what we do not know, we probably would take small steps in order to initiate a major initiative. And that is what we call the piloting stage. And a piloting stage is to test or validate uh, some of the concepts that we're trying to introduce. In this way, the cost of failure is minimized and the value of new information to be realized is achieved at a smaller cost. So let's see how this could be applied in terms of energy efficiency. And at this stage, thanks to the, uh, thanks to the overview that was given by uh, Under Secretary Fuentebella, I think that makes my life a lot easier by just focusing on a particular area of energy efficiency. So if we go to the next slide. Yeah. Is energy efficiency a hurdle or is it a price? Yeah. There are two ways of looking at the world. Yeah. One is if we look at what the law, what the law is actually uh, posing as a challenge for most of us, we can either take the attitude of, my goodness, we're going to transform 81 provinces, 144 cities, 1,490 municipalities, 17 administrative regions, and let's just stop there, and easily the numbers could easily uh, build up. And I think the last, as of the last count, just stopping at the administrative regions, we're probably talking about 3,000 different government agencies at the local level that needs to adopt an energy efficient approach to managing their yeah, to managing their uh, to managing their public public uh, offices and the public buildings. Now, if we add the barangays, we're talking about 42,000 more into the pot. Now, somebody sitting in the private sector would probably look at this as an opportunity. And the price could be, if we can make it work and we can have a successful implementation of energy efficiency, one can only imagine the price. And I think under Secretary Fuentebella has given us some numbers. We're talking about not a few hundred or a few thousand pesos to be saved, but we're talking probably in the, in the region of millions, if not billions of pesos that one can save. And by saving that uh, kind of money, we are probably able to redirect some of the expenditures into some of the projects that is closest to the heart of local government. So how do we get started? Let's go to the next slide. I think the easiest way that I could think of in trying to tackle what I consider to be a wicked problem with wicked solutions, which is what energy efficiency is all about, is to think in terms of some kind of analogy. And there's no better analogy than dieting and energy efficiency. Well, what's the, what's the similarity between dieting and using our energy efficiently? Let's go through some of the steps we have to undertake in starting our dieting. And also at the same time, realizing that the reason the dieting industry is a multi-billion dollar industry is because people tend to start and not persist. And by not persisting, one does not sustain the gains from dieting. Yeah. Energy efficiency is probably no different from that. Yeah. So let's see what are some of the similarities. Before we start on dieting, we want to know how much we're weighing. Yeah. Because by knowing how much we weigh, we would probably have some idea of how much weight we need to shed or lose. Yeah? So in the case of energy efficiency, that is equivalent to establishing some kind of a baseline energy volume 
that we want to uh, we want to work with. So in some cases, if you want to reduce 10%, then it is good to know 10% of what. So let's just take for the simple exercise of quantifying some of these numbers. If we're starting with 1,000 unit and 10% is 100 unit, then by knowing the 100 as our objective delta or the objective chains, then it is probably a lot more doable for us to scale the kind of challenge that we're facing. So it's 100 a big deal or it's 100 a small deal, yeah? So the next thing that we do is probably to consult a nutritionist. And a nutritionist would give us a diet. And in the case of energy efficiency, eating well is equivalent to having a supply mix. And I think as mentioned earlier, the supply mix has a target of increasing the proportion of renewable energy to 35%. Yes. So if that is how we understand eating well means and what an ideal or an objective supply mix would look like, then it becomes more doable when we combine that with the information we get from weighing ourselves. Yeah. Then you go into exercising. Yeah. Exercising would be the steps that we need to, to take in order to reduce the volume by using energy more efficiently. So in the case of dieting, we might want to do some, we might want to start with 10 minutes of exercise, eventually increasing that to 20 minutes, eventually increasing that to one hour or probably more. Yeah. Now, the way we try to track our progress is the ability to measure whether we're actually going in the right direction by losing weight. Yeah. So in the case of energy efficiency, we would like to have a way of reporting the outcomes and attributing some of the factors that are contributing to the decline in our energy volume consumption. Now, as we talk about sustaining, sustaining has to do with changing habits. Yeah? And changing habits is to have a different kind of lifestyle which is sustainable. Now, in energy efficiency terms, one talks about what are the other means of scaling up the efficiency measures that we have already introduced. So aside from increasing the pace of the exercise or scaling up the amount of energy efficiency measures that we put in place, is there a role for actually reconfiguring the way we do uh, deliver things or deliver our work, yeah, or actually reconfiguring the way our public buildings are designed. Yeah, so that I think is leading us to a more sustainable future. Yeah. So if we go to the next slide, yeah. When we talk about creating opportunities, we start with piloting. Yeah. Of course, a pilot scheme. It's always a very, a, a very much of an abuse uh, concept to talk about. Yeah. Because when we talk about pilot, we oftentimes start piloting something without a very clear idea of what is it we're trying to pilot. Yeah. So let me propose three areas where we could pilot in undertaking an energy efficiency program. Yeah. So let's say the objective that we have is to reduce our energy use and I would add to that, other than reducing the energy use, we pl probably would like to influence the kind of energy that we're using. Yeah, and this is where substituting fossil fuel with renewable energy. Yeah. So what are some of the tools that we can think of? Yeah, in terms of the pilot for the tools, we can talk about the low hanging fruits. Some of the low hanging fruits is to change some of the light bulbs that you have in your buildings, probably change the way the configuration of your buildings, a lower use of air conditioning, or actually changing the kind of air conditioning units that you have, 
from the conventional air conditioning uh, air conditioning units into something that is using converters. Yeah, yeah, and uh, with the new technology, there are new types of air conditioning one can see and actually experiment by piloting how much energy is actually being saved as a consequence of that. Yeah. So, but piloting has the objective of learning and adapting on what actually works and what doesn't work and understanding why it doesn't work. Or if it works, why things work the way they do. Yeah. So I think some of the lessons to be learned from that is the ability to repurpose. Yeah. And by repurposing the way we cool down our buildings, an example of that is changing conventional air conditioning with converters, then we can actually measure on how much is the savings. So is it a savings of 10% or is it a savings of two thirds of what we use to consume? Yeah. So the ability to measure gives us also information on what actually matters in redesigning the processes that we have, in redesigning the kind of buildings that we have. Yeah. And then that allows us to go and, and scale yeah, the initiatives that we have on energy efficiency by reconfiguring, by adapting the metrics, and by adapting some protocols as we achieve certain designs that would give us a proof of concept that certain tools actually, actually work. But this is not simply a question of toolkits. It is also a question of behavior, yeah? Because human beings will adopt a toolkit and probably not develop the right habits. Yeah, so some of the examples of low-hanging fruits in terms of behavior is to simply look at, let's say, a very, a very, a very uh, simple example would be if we want to go from one floor of the building to another floor of the building, do we always use the elevator? Well, probably in some cases, and I was pleasantly surprised in visiting one of the major energy companies here in the Philippines, that there is a big sign in the elevator that says, if you're going to go down one or two floors, or even if you want to do some exercise, use the stairs instead of the elevator to go up or down one or two floors uh, in the building. Yeah. And of course, the incentives for that or the reward for that is to say, where are you going to gain a better health by exercising, by walking more? Yeah. So in, in this case, as far as the rewards is concerned for energy efficiency, and this is where I think the energy efficiency law has already provided for that. And this brings us to the next stage of our conversation that rewards for resources and remuneration becomes an important reinforcing uh, factor in influencing behavior so that people would actually adopt the tools that are available to save energy. So next slide, please. Yeah. And I think this is probably where a lot of the work will need to be done. Yeah. Yeah. So as an LGU, I think one of the realization very early on is to say, yes, of course, we're committed to save energy. Of course, we're committed to adopt all these wonderful toolkits that are available, but please show us how. And this is where the acquisition of the skills and ensuring that the skills that we're trying to acquire are the right skills leads us to the first two steps that are essential to kickstarting an energy efficiency program that actually is more likely to, to succeed. Yeah? So I would say, start with the training of technicians, start with energy audit, and the energy audit would give us the ability to actually weigh and scale uh, the type of challenges that we're facing 
the certification is giving us the ability not only to provide the right types of skills to install energy efficiency systems, but also I think one of the programs that is being proposed and being, uh, being deployed by the Development Academy of the Philippines is the energy management program that would provide the leadership uh, for LGU to orchestrate the resources and the incentive systems that are available. Yeah. So long the short of it, let's get started with the 10 top LGUs or the 20 top LGUs with the best proposals yeah, that the national government can consider, experiment on the approaches that they're proposing and learn from those experiments. Then scale it up by training or learning from the pilot projects and scale it up to the next, next group of LGUs. And before you know it, within six months or one year time, we already have more LGUs adopting than the number of LGUs who has adopted energy efficiency in the last two or three years. Yeah. And at the end of the day, we would hopefully be able to create a critical mass where a market led by the private sector and working with the public sector yeah, could already make energy efficiency as a lifestyle choice and as, as an ability for us to create the marketplace where incentives are actually provided. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Rick, for a wealth of knowledge and tips you shared with us. Next, to discuss the salient points of the EEC law in relation to LGUs, we have the current director of the Energy Utilization Management Bureau of the Department of Energy. He is Career Executive Service Officer, rank three, who rose from the ranks and has served in various capacities in DOE from the Office of the Secretary, Information Technology Management Services, and Energy Policy and Planning Bureau. Recognizing the need for sustainable energy consumption, our resource speaker, with the support of DOE in aggressively implementing the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Act and the Electric Vehicle Industry Development Act. Please let us all welcome Director Patrick D. Aquino. Good day. Let's talk about Energy Efficiency and Conservation, EEC Act. Republic Act Number 11285 is the blueprint for EEC. It institutionalizes and enhances EEC by providing incentives, encouraging the development and utilization of efficient renewable energy technologies to ensure sustainable energy resources. The Interagency Energy Efficiency and Conservation Committee, or IAEECC, created under Section 35 of the EEC Act is chaired by the Department of Energy with representatives from the Departments of Transportation, the Interior and Local Government, Finance, Science and Technology, Budget and Management, Public Works and Highways, Trade and Industry, and the National Development Economic Authority. The IAEECC was created to evaluate and approve government energy efficiency projects and provide strategic direction in the implementation of the Government Energy Management Program, GMP, which is the government-wide program to monitor and reduce electricity and fuel consumption by at least 10% through efficient utilization. The GMP now covers the whole of government, including local government units, constitutional commissions, and foreign service posts. To ensure its sound implementation, the IAEECC issued resolution number one on October 2020 directing all government entities to comply with the GMP. Resolution number one directs all heads of government entities to designate an Energy Efficiency and Conservation Officer, EECO, who will lead in the implementation of their respective EEC plans consistent with the GMP. 
the AECO shall oversee the regular submission of repertorial requirements to the Department of Energy, who is mandated to conduct energy audits and spot checks and propose improvements to the GMP. In 2019, or before the passage of the EEC Act, electricity savings was recorded at almost 5 million kilowatt hours. With the passage of the EEC Act, the cumulative electricity savings further increased to 17 million kilowatt hours in the first quarter of 2023. The awareness of government entities regarding the GMP also improved due to the increase in number of government offices that were audited and spot checked. IAEECC Resolution No. 2, issued on June 2021, directs the use of energy-efficient light-emitting diode LED lamps in government buildings and facilities. Government entities are highly encouraged to comply with the resolution as soon as possible but not later than January 2027. The resolution likewise provides rules for the Department of Trade and Industry, the Department of Budget and Management Procurement Service, and the Department of Science and Technology. IAEECC Resolution No. 3, issued on October 2021, directs the use of inverter-type air conditioning units or similar equivalent technologies. It also mandates the observance of the provisions of Section 76 of the EEC Act IRR on waste management, collection, and recycling and disposal to prevent any negative impacts on the environment brought about by the replacement of non-energy efficient air conditioning units. As EEC is considered an integral solution to cushion the volatility of energy costs and help mitigate threats of the climate change, its inclusion as a criterion in the grant of the seal of good local governance was approved by the IAEECC via Resolution No. 4, issued on December 2021. The recognition of EEC in the grant of the seal will support the LGU's critical role in the implementation of the GMP, as well as the promotion of efficient and traditional use of energy within the areas of jurisdiction. The DOE and DILG shall develop and formulate the set of performance indicator to be part and included in the set of criteria for the grant of the seal. IAEECC Resolution No. 5 directs all government entities, including LGUs and Foreign Service Posts, to observe the approved GMP guidelines, and this came into effect on February 2022. The GMP guidelines served as the main directive for the implementation of the GMP and highlights the formulation of the EEC programs for government entities. It also provides details and modalities for the funding of government energy efficiency projects, including the approval process adopted by the IAEECC. IAEECC Resolution No. 6, issued on April 2022, recommended to the Governance Commission for Government-Owned and Controlled Corporations to consider, include, and adopt EEC as one of the criteria in the performance evaluation system for GOCCs in the grant of the performance-based incentives. This will encourage GOCCs to comply with the EEC Act and GMP, fostering EEC as a way of life. IAEECC Resolution No. 7, encouraging the adoption of flexible work arrangements for all government entities as part of the government's EEC measures under the GMP, encourages the adoption of flexible work arrangement such as a combination of four-day on-site and one-day work-from-home arrangement or other flexible work arrangements for government entities to minimize the impact of steep global prices of petroleum products, reduce consumption of both electricity and fuel for the whole of government, and alleviate traffic congestion. The flexible work arrangements may be implemented in a manner that ensures the effective and efficient performance of government functions and delivery of public service with due consideration to the peculiar circumstances of each government entity. In support of IAEECC Resolution No. 7, the DOE conducted its own study of savings incurred from the flexible work arrangement. 
With its implementation, electricity consumption in the DOE central office has been significantly reduced. For the monitored period flashed on the screen, electricity savings from on-site versus work-from-home days stood at 49%, with the average daily consumption Monday to Thursday calculated from the average daily consumption for the days since the start of the arrangement versus the consumption calculated from the average daily consumption during Fridays when work from home is in place. Flashed on the screen is the DOE savings in terms of electricity consumption as well as its peso equivalent. Even with the resumption of air conditioning use for Fridays due to the high heat index, electricity savings continue to be achieved. This demonstrates that the flexible work arrangement results to actual savings for the government and its employees. Upcoming resolutions from the IAEECC include the inclusion of the Climate Change Commission, CCC, as a regular resource institution in the IAEECC in an advisory capacity to harmonize the approval and implementation of government energy efficiency projects classified as climate change expenditures. Another upcoming resolution from the IAEECC is encouraging all government entities to install and utilize solar photovoltaic PV system or any equivalent renewable energy technology in their government-owned facilities and or office buildings in the form of self-generating distributed energy resource or net metering arrangement with the host distribution utilities. Government entities are encouraged as part of their compliance to the GEMP to have an assessment on the installation and utilization of a solar PV system or any RE equivalent technology in their government-owned facilities within three years. It references the requirements and parameters for the installation of solar PV system according to existing rules and regulation, highlighting the roles of the DOE and the Department of Public Works and Highways as well as distribution utilities in providing support for government entities that will undertake this project. The third upcoming resolution from the IAEECC are the guidelines on the aggregation of electricity demand for government entities as contestable customers in the retail competition and open access as part of the GMP. This resolution would define the threshold for contestability aggregation of government entities within a contiguous area and the general procedures for aggregation. It likewise details the metering requirements, billing and payment, and procurement of retail supply contracts. All IAEECC resolutions are published in a newspaper of general circulation as well as available in the DOE website for reference. In support of EEC officers and focal persons, the DOE issued the GMP guidelines on strengthening the EEC professionals, the adoption of training module for capacity building, and prescribing certification process for the recognition of training institutions. Given the complexity and sheer number of government buildings and facilities, there is a need to strengthen the capacity of EEC professionals in the government sector for purposes of effective implementation of their respective EEC plans. This issue once prescribes the training modules for the certification of EEC professionals under the GMP as well as the recognition of training institutions to implement the training modules. As part of our continuous efforts to support and streamline the submission process under the GEMP, the GEMP online system has been developed. The EEC Public Sector Management Division of the DOEEUMB regularly conducts workshops and trainings for all government entities on its use and navigation. Under the Guidelines on the Energy Efficiency Excellence EEE Awards, which aims to promote the implementation of energy management system and best practices on EEC for the private and public sectors. Here are the local government units that have received the EEE award in recognition of their efforts for going above and beyond the implementation of their EEC plans as well as their GMP compliance. The EEE awards is conferred every December in celebration of the National Energy Consciousness Month and ECM. Before ending, 
we wish to impart that you have the power as energy efficiency starts with you. Let's make EEC a national way of life. This has been Director Patrick Tiaquino of the Energy Utilization Management Bureau of the Department of Energy. Thank you for your kind attention. Good day. Thank you so much, Director Patrick. Later, we will have Director Patrick during our open forum. Okay. I hope everyone was enriched with the knowledge and expertise from our first three speakers. But don't you worry because we have a lot more interesting discussions this afternoon. To keep the discussion rolling, let us now hear our next speakers from the local government units who will share about their current initiatives in implementing energy efficiency and conservation in their respective LGUs. Our first LGU sharer is the current local chief executive of Manawag, Pangasinan. He earned his earned doctorate his doctor of, of medicine. medicine. I think I'm hearing echo. <laughs> Sorry about that. He earned his Doctor of Medicine in De La Salle University in 1991. As a legislator, he authored numerous ordinances, including the Health and Sanitation Code of Pangasinan, granting incentives or tax discounts of 20% for prompt payment of taxes within the territorial jurisdiction of the province of Pangasinan, institutionalizing the provincial scholarship program uh, for the poor but deserving students of the province of Pangasinan, institutionalizing Governor's Excellence Award on academic and leadership in the province of Pangasinan, maternal, neonatal child health and strategy, anti-calibration act designed to protect the buying public from inaccurate measurement and low quality of petroleum products through the implementation of regular calibration checking. Please let us all welcome the Mayor of Manawag, Pangasinan, Honorable Dr. Jeremy Ajerico Rosari. Thank you. Uh, pleasant afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Sharisa, first the IUSEC, uh, Felix Fentebedia, and uh, the rest of the other uh, analysts. Pleasant afternoon. In behalf of the LGU Manawag, we would like to express our gratitude for uh, inviting us to uh, give this opportunity to, to share our humble yet effective uh, measures and programs being undertaken by our LGU in support to Republic Act 118285. Uh, I know that we're only given 10 minutes. That's why uh, we're going to uh, go direct to uh, our uh, presentation. Next slide, please. The presentation is divided into three parts. For the first being the introduction of the municipality of Manawa followed by the current programs and activities of energy efficiency and conservation. And lastly, the future plans and uh, further to further our outcomes and for the sustainability of the current achievements. Next slide. Uh, for our municipal profile, uh, we are a first-class municipality with a land area of 5,700 hectares. And uh, the latest uh, population growth is at 75,968 with 26 barangays, uh, two urban and 24 rural areas. The source of our electrical supply is a decor. Next slide. Slide number five. And uh, in terms of energy usage, uh, I would like to highlight on the existing facilities which includes 12 buildings and uh, five of which are recently constructed. And uh, as you can notice, uh, December has been uh, big because of, of course, the festivities uh, during December. And uh, uh, it also noticed that uh, September, October is uh, also quite uh, bigger uh, in our uh, data of 2022. Next slide. And uh, as, to the, as to the fuel consumption, uh, the, we use uh, primarily diesel engine for our uh, mobile sources. And uh, the total consumption that recorded is at 54,456.33 liters, amounting to 3,267,000. 379 and 91 pesos. 
Next slide. In terms of uh, mobile sources, all of the municipal vehicles are uh, uses diesel engine. And uh, based on our data, the month of October uh, has been the most fuel intensive for our LGU. And uh, tracing back uh, that, that, that time, uh, we, we had some problems with our uh, dump site. That's why we have available the services of a lot of equipments to address the, the dump site problem uh, during those times. And uh, next slide. And uh, for July 13, 2022, as the LC, uh, I have signed the memorandum number five, which requires all offices to implement the EEC activities in their offices, especially the 4 p.m. habit, which requires all offices to turn off their air conditioning units, keeping the thermostat of their air conditioning units at 23 degrees and uh, switching off all appliances and equipments, including gadgets that are not used, and also the creation of a team to consistently monitor the compliance of the said memo. Next slide. And I have signed also Executive Order Number 102, Series of 2022, the, the designating an Energy Efficiency and Conservation Officer. And uh, we have uh, designated our MENRO as our EECO with the following duties. To formulate EEC plan for the municipality, submit to a DOA EEC reports, programs and activities, and keep close coordination with the DOA. Next slide. Likewise, uh, in line with the EEC programs and activities, all our 26 barangays uh, are now in transition to uh, solar street lights. Currently, uh, 16 barangays have uh, provided with financial assistance, courtesy of the LGU, for solar street lighting, amounting to 600,000 per barangay. A total of uh, 800 meters of street per barangay is now being serviced by solar street lights. And uh, with EEC programs and activities shift to energy efficient technologies, our offices are uh, our offices uh, with 100% shift to the uh, LED bulbs and in all LGU owned and controlled facilities. All of our 52 inverter type air conditioning units has been installed. And uh, with a current, uh, with a verbal order that uh, all purchases of air conditioning system be all uh, inverter type. Next slide. And uh, uh, ride sharing has been promoted and mass transport. We have ensured that all travel orders are filled earlier to develop an itinerary plan, regular maintenance of municipal vehicles, and we have encouraged our drivers to prohibit idling of municipal vehicles and promotion of ride sharing or mass transport. As you can see on the picture, we were a recipient of uh, a grant or a donation coming from uh, Jack Liner, who uh, uh, gave us uh, a service bus, uh, which we dubbed as a one man bus to uh, ferry our employees and our people in, uh, in the mass transport and uh, well, uh, uh, lessening the usage of other uh, vehicles. Next slide. And uh, with the energy audit, we have conducted energy audit in cooperation with PNOCRC and submitted data requirements and results of the energy audit to the Department of Energy. And uh, we have likewise uh, main inventory and management program uh, to track the reduced greenhouse gas emission from energy sector. And uh, we have uh, targeted the sector on energy uh, uh, under uh, the municipal's LC Cup uh, for 2023 
to 2028. So, and uh, with the results of these EEC programs and activities, certainly there is savings. The greenhouse gas has been reduced and we have an improved working condition in our workforce and working areas. So as to the savings, highlighting on December 2022, uh, compared to uh, January, there is a savings of uh, 6,269 pesos and 53 for one, uh, one account. And uh, as to the greenhouse gas reduction, comparing June 2022 to uh, July of 2022 with the implementation of the program, uh, savings was uh, computed at 5,001.26 with the greenhouse the gas reduction of 0.28 tons uh, carbon dioxide equation. So way forward, we incorporate green design for future infrastructure projects, formulate local energy efficiency and conservation plan, develop an optimization routing plan for municipal vehicles, 100% shift to LED bulbs and inverter type air conditioning systems. This has been implemented in, uh, this year and the establishment of a solar farm and a municipal eco park. So again, uh, in behalf of the Pinagpalang Bayan ng Manawag, we say thank you for uh, listening. That's all. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, Mayor Ming, for sharing the programs and activities and, of course, the ways forward of Manawag. So our next LGU sharer works as a Project Development Officer 2 from the City Architect Department of the Quezon City Local Government. He is in charge of the electrical design of the city's vertical infrastructure and design of solar energy product, projects. He is also a member of the Technical Working Group for Quezon City's Initiative on Climate Mitigation. Since 2017, he has worked and assisted various departments of the city government relative to the design of projects for electrical systems. He is also responsible for the preparation of initial cost estimates of projects for bidding to ensure clarity and correctness of work programs. Here to represent the LG of Quezon City on the EEC efforts and practices, we have engineer Arvin Arga. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, first, we would like to thank uh, Hello. Ah, presentation mo. Excuse me. Uh, first, we would like to thank the Development Academy of the Philippines for inviting Quezon City and giving us the opportunity to present our initiatives on renewable energy and energy efficiency and conservation. Next slide, please. Um, just a quick background, Quezon City is located in the northeast portion of Metro Manila. It is the biggest city in terms of land area and population among the seven cities and municipality forming Metro Manila. Um, the city's land area is more than 16,000 hectares. We have more, more than 3 million population and more than 65,000 registered business establishments. Um, Quezon City's climate and sustainability actions, including our initiatives on energy efficiency and conservation, as well as renewable energy are guided by the city's enhanced local climate change action plan 2021 to 2050. The plan shows the city's commitment to climate strategy, strategy that is compatible with the objectives of the 
Paris Agreement, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and a green and just recovery. This plan is ambitious and evidence-based roadmap towards building climate re resilience, pursuing carbon neutrality, advancing green economic development, and building a livable and quality community for all. Next slide, please. To ensure a responsive climate action plan, we have undergone a strategic process involving science-based approaches. We have built our evidence base with, con with the conduct of greenhouse gas emissions inventory in 2019 and climate risk assessment as well as scenario modeling in 2020. The city-wide greenhouse gas emission ev inventory covers stationary energy, transportation, and waste sectors following the Global Protocol for Community Scale Greenhouse Gas Emission Inventories, or the GPC. Based on the city's inventory results in 2016 as a baseline, the stationary energy sectors contributes a large, large amount of emission share, account, accounting to 60% of the total emissions. This is followed by the transport sector at 21%, then waste at 19%. Of the 60% emission from the stationary energy, commercial sector is the biggest contributor with, the, with 51% followed by manufacturing and residential. This shows the potential of energy efficiency and conservation and also renewable energy and what this can contribute as we target an interim of 30% greenhouse gas emission reduction by 2030 and carbon neutrality by 2050. Republic Act 9513 or the Renewable Energy Act of 2008 and Republic Act 11285 or the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Act serve as a framework for the city's various policies and programs. Next slide, please. Before I proceed with the city's initiatives on renewable energy and energy efficiency, let me give a short background on two relevant national legislations which serve as a framework for the city's various policies and programs. First is the Republic Act 9513 or the Renewable Energy Act of 2008, which aims to accelerate exploration and development of renewable energy resources achieve energy self-reliance and adoption of clean energy to mitigate effect of climate change. Next slide, please. Uh, second is the Republic Act 11285 or the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Act, which aims to institutionalize energy efficiency and conservation, promote and encourage the development and utilization of efficient renewable energy technologies and systems, and ensure a market-driven approach to energy efficiency, conservation, sufficiency, and sustainability. As mentioned a while ago, 60% uh, of Quezon City's emissions in 2016 came from its stationary energy. This goes to show that the city's built environment gets the majority share of emissions and therefore suggests that the need to prioritize these sectors for the city to be directed to a low and eventually zero emission economic pathway. Strategy 8 focuses on green, energy efficient, and resilient buildings. All sectors will be enjoined to achieve the objectives of this strategy targeting 80 to 100% fully compliant buildings to the Green Building Code by 2030. As of now, we are currently amending the code to raise minimum energy efficiency requirements for buildings and increase the rate of compliance towards a robust building energy code with appropriate incentives, including, including renewable energy, energy installations such as solar PV systems. Energy efficiency and conservation will, be, will also be promoted aligned 
with the country's National Energy Efficiency and Conservation Program. Next slide, please. Renewable energy will play an important role in our climate change mitigation plans. Strategy 9 aims to secure a clean and affordable renewable energy access with the Quezon City government leading the way. Currently, we have six buildings within the Quezon City Hall compound and two public schools that have installed solar PV systems. We also have ongoing initiative to initially solarize 50 public schools and three government-owned hospitals. This will be expanded in other public schools and city-owned facilities to promote the use of technology in other sectors, which can significantly reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. Our plan is to solarize 100% of our public schools and other key government buildings that are feasible for solar PV installations. Leveraging renewable energy policy mechanisms, including incentive schemes provided for by the Renewable Energy Act is also a priority. Next, pl next slide, please. With the passing of, ener of the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Act in 2019, Quezon City is more than ever empowered to deliver programs that reduce energy demands, promote utility savings, and cut emissions. Strategy 10 targets the mainstreaming of energy efficiency and conservation in government-owned buildings and facilities. The city government is required to submit a local energy efficiency and conservation plan, or the LEECP, and also implement the Government Energy Management plan Program, or the GEMP, to reduce electricity and fuel consumption annually. Some initiatives we are currently undertaking... Some initiatives we, we are currently undertaking is the replacement of lighting systems into LED and the installation, retrofitting, repair, and maintenance of city street lights through the implementation of integrated energy efficient street lighting program, among others. On sustainable transport, the city aims to reduce disruptive and destructive emissions from motorized transport with the utilization and promotion of electric vehicles. Through the Quezon City Bus Augmentation Program, um, the city's existing bus fleet covering eight roads with about 100 buses will be scaled up through the introduction of electric buses to reduce its carbon emissions while improving air quality. More than 8.5 million passengers have been served by this free public transportation system that is the first of its kind operated by an LGU in the country. Another initiative is the Quezon City e-tricycle program, we, wherein conventional tricycles will be replaced with electric tricycles. Since 2020, uh, we have distributed around 278 donated e-tricycles to operators and drivers. However, uh, we are targeting more than 24,000 tra traditional tricycles for replacement. Along with the transition to e-vehicles, there is also a need for infrastructure development, particularly fast charging stations strategically located around the city to address range anxiety and charging time concerns. Last April, um, the Honorable Mayor issued Executive Order Number 15 designating the Quezon City Energy Conservation Officers, creating the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Technical Working Group, and also assigning an Energy Efficiency Energy Efficiency and Conservation Focal Person per City Department and Office to ensure the compliance to RA 11285 and lead the preparation and implementation of the local energy efficiency and conservation plan. Next slide, please. Aside from the strategy, 
yes. would like to call your attention. We can give you, I think, 30 seconds to wrap it up. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, aside from the strategies and priorities actions in our enhanced local climate action plan, we also have existing technical assistance from the C40 Cities Climate um, Leadership Group and the United Nations Economic and Social Commissions for Asia and the Pacific, or the ESCAP. With the funding of, from the UK government assist, and assistance from the C40 cities, the Climate Action Implementation Program provides implementation support to the city's policies and, and initiatives on energy efficiency and conservation through the adoption of renewable energy in government-owned commercial and residential buildings as well the, as the enhancement of the Green Building Code. Um, uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Engineer, for sharing the practices of Quezon City. So we move on to our uh, last LGU sharer. Our sharer for this uh, moment will be uh, the who will work, sorry, under the City Planning and Development Department and is currently designated as the Division Chief of the Green Building Authority of the City Government of Mandaluyong. Please welcome our research speaker from the Local Government Unit of Mandaluyong City, Architect Abraham Raposon, Jr. Sir, we would, can you unmute? Okay. Uh, magandang hapon po sa inyong lahat. Okay. Uh, on behalf of the City Mayor of Mandaluyong, uh, Mayor Ben Abalos, it's an honor to present to you the Mandaluyong experience. Uh, although it's a limited time in presenting this uh, material, uh, we get, I'm going to try my best to walk through to the experience of Mandaluyong. Next slide, sheet. So, magandang hapon po sa inyong lahat. Uh, sa kapwa ako pa ni ng uh, Luzon, Visayas, Mindanao. Uh, it's an honor to present to you the Mandaluyong experience. Uh, as my presentation content, uh, we're gonna walk through the city profiling historical snapshots, initiative of and for the protection and promotion of sustainable environment, as well as green building regulation, as the green building project of the city and next step of sustainability. Next, please. So stock, uh, statistical snapshot of Mandaluyong uh, being located at the center of the metro mat metropolitan Manila as well as the growth area of uh, north and south and uh, strategic location of its uh, said advantage. Uh, being uh, a 27 barangay with a po population of 425,000 during daytime uh, uh, with a daytime population of 1.5 million during daytime as well as the uh, indicator of economy, uh, social services, as well as infrastructure being uh, laid down to the city of Mandaluyong. Next, please. So these are the snapshot of uh, Mandaluyong City 100 years ago, uh, as well as the present uh, landmark in Mandaluyong, which is San Felipe Church. Next. Uh, as well as um, when, uh, institutional uh, facilities in Mandaluyong, being mental, being uh, labaso loob, marinda, being joke as, uh, where do you live? Kapag sinabi pong Mandaluyong, either labaso o loob lang po ang, mm -hmm. ang magiging uh, uh, next question po ng nagtanong. So either nasa welfare bill uh, institution ka or nasa correctional ka. Next please. <laughs> Uh, this is our snapshot of the seat of government from the 1930s up to the present, being uh, the traditional uh, two-story in the 1930s as well in the 1950s and uh, so forth. Next. Uh, these are the snapshot of EDSA corridor fronting uh, the Guadalupe Bridge as well as the development from the 1950s onwards up to the present and the present development. Next, please. 
uh, these are the, the current uh, landscape of Mandaluyong City being uh, highly built up uh, LGUs. Next. So the city of Mandaluyong, as, uh, its mainstream, our objectives of institutionalizing the government being uh, acquired or the uh, ISO 9001-2015 standard last 2021, wherein the, the Mandaluyong City government aimed to provide effective institutional management, social, as well as livelihood development, environmental, and emphasis to the people the importance of collective action, maintaining its capability to be independent and sustainable development. With our vision, next please, uh, being a world-class city, Responsible and uh, resilient society, living in secured, well-planned, sustainable and peaceful environment that nurture inclusive economic growth toward global competence under the leadership that is visionary, dynamic, and proactive. Next, please. Uh, this is, our, is the snapshot of the awarding uh, during the 2001 uh, awarding of the nine, nine, ISO 91,000 certificate. Next, please. Uh, as well as the initiative of the city uh, in terms of the protection and promotion of sustainable environment, uh, one of the identified uh, project that we embark is the replacement of the uh, high dense, high pressure sodium light, which is 250 watts, 215 LED watts, uh, which uh, comprise of 46% uh, energy saving uh, to the, our main street. Uh, these are in the snapshot of the barangay that uh, street that they implemented uh, up to present. Next. As well as the initiative of uh, solar harvesting on, or street lighting on our Boni Tunnel, which, uh, which the DOE Department of Energy uh, uh, sponsored us way back in 2014. And uh, by institutionalizing it to the regulation and uh, ordinances, which we continues to to uh, to maintain up to the present. Next, uh, the energy efficiency program of the replacement of modernization of uh, EBKL way back in 2011. Uh, the had been piloted to to the study program of the 20 units from the ADB that the uh, produce the present uh, DOE project of 2021. Uh, the donation of uh, uh, E-Trike, which we distributed to the, to the members to the whole of Mandaluyong. Next, please. Also, the adoption of the Isakai Transport Development Route along uh, Mandaluyong City Hall to the Makati area, which we embarked to e-transition to modernization of our uh, E-Jeepney, as well as the... Uh, mainstreaming it to the to the member uh, to date as the mandaluyong and part to the the uh, e-trike uh, egypt flagship program of the city to be distributed by 100 units of uh, ebkl uh, was signed last week from uh, our city official and our city mayor to mainstream the the modernization act of uh, 2017 up to present next <clears throat> As well as the protection for environment of the smoke reef Mandaluyong, as well as the anti-smoke blasting activity, as well as uh, of the traffic management division of anti-smoke belching unit, uh, as well as protection for our health. Next. Uh, this initiative or the protection of environment by the solid waste management plan, as well as uh, different uh, activities from the material recovery facilities by diesel program recycling and composting as well as uh, the use of uh, banning the plastic bag or styrofoam as well as the cleanup drives along waterways and creeks next so as well as the maintenance of cleanup drive on waterways and the sludging of septic stock among the bar different barangays in Mandaluyo as well as in coordination with the uh, barangay community next so the green uh, mainstream of the uh, greening park of the, our Garden of Light Park. Next. So as well as the linear park development to yeah. encourage the active the walkable city of the city. Next. So uh, additional uh, mainstreaming of the 
bike lane active transport mobility had been implemented uh, last two years during the pandemics. Next. Next. Uh, these are the snapshot of the city project in implementing this uh, active black side mobility. Next. So next. So the green building project of the regulation of the Mandaluyong start way back in 2012 with the cooperation agreement with the IFC as well as the our secretary Benor Avalos as the cha green champion during that time uh, continuous uh, advocacy and uh, uh, commitment in uh, establishing the green building uh, regulation. Next. Uh, these are the activities that uh, pre-adoption activity, the orientation as well as the, the important uh, aspect of public stakeholder consultation has been the key in, in implementation of our green building regulation. Next. Uh, twin, during the uh, next, uh, during the 2018, uh, we have adopted uh, version two of the green building regulation to comply with the national standards, uh, the issuance of 2015 green building code. Uh, as a referral code of the national building of national building code as referral code to the the energy efficiency next so the comparative analysis of uh, during the 2014 version as well as the 2018 which is uh, from 18 mandatory as well as uh, we expanded to 40 green building measure 20 mandatory and 12 optional which also have uh, we integrate the incentive scheme uh, for the qualified uh, green building project as well as the uh, compliant buildings. Next. Uh, these are the mandatory measure in green with the, uh, the version two and version one, which we expand to uh, different areas, uh, the building energy audit, uh, the efficiency of mechanical system, electrical system, as well as different uh, measure. Next. So uh, these are the uh, uh, certification project of the city. Next. So uh, uh, to give you the emphasis of the importance of this uh, uh, ordinance, uh, we have a, uh, next. Uh, we computed had uh, almost uh, implemented a 3.8 million uh, green building issue uh, that the city had been uh, hold to the requirements of the building permit. Next. So we, as to date, we have already issued a green building compliance certificate for the 12 uh, uh, green building projects. So to sum up this, uh, uh, next, next one. So next, so let me jump to the, the last uh, slide for in the next step. Uh, these are the city project that uh, we've been implemented. Uh, with uh, as our model um, project that we can walk through the our implementation the green building project as well as the the lead in the local government in implementing the the green building ordinance in in energy efficiency and conservation next next uh, these are the latest project and completed projects for the city next next so our, uh, we have uh, big projects that we implemented and uh, uh, features the implemented uh, green building efficiency in the buildings. Next. 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 So, next. Next. Uh, as a highlight of the proposed project, uh, the legislative building that we are on the pipeline this year has uh, implemented uh, our, the energy building features with the passive cooling, energy efficient system, operable windows, and shading and all the features of the green building structure and uh, measure. Next. So as my uh, summary, uh, next step in sustainability, uh, we have pipeline in the, to revisit the green building ordinance implementation uh, for us to, to adapt the principle of circular building and construction practices, as well as the devolution transition plan in implementing the RA 11285 in creation of energy efficiency and conservation office as well as in pipeline for the version three of the, our current uh, experiences for review the, the, the geophysical, the pandemic, as well as uh, continued improvement of governance, as well as innovation and technology. So maybe later we have a question that we can have discussed this in details. Uh, thank you.
Thank you so much, Architect Raposon, for presenting us the accomplishments and the city's next steps. All right, we are halfway through the discussion of our webinar. We would like to check first with our attendees, very quick one, a show of thumbs up reaction from our dear participants, if you're empowered and energized. Okay, so I see in our Zoom chat box, we have a lot, I think, okay, marami na. Ayan, nandito pa ang ating mga participants here with us. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, so let's now proceed to the next part of the program. We invited energy and local government experts to share with us their reactions and insights. Allow me to introduce our reactors one by one. Our first reactor is Dr. Aser Habien. He is the president and chief consultant of Elkhorn Governance Consulting Corporation in USA. He is the current advisor or consultant to local officials in the Philippines and Japan and adjunct or affiliate faculty of the Asian Institute of Management, Development Academy of the Philippines, Ateneo School of Government, De La Salle College of Business and Economics, Nagoya University, Japan, and former professor from UP Los Banos. He authored four books, six international refereed journals, and 103 commission policy and program researches on local governance and local economic development. He earned his doctorate degree in international development from Nagoya University. Next, our second reactor is engineer Job Jacob Gonzalez. Engineer Gonzalez has been actively involved in working with the energy sector for 17 years now, where he became part of the conceptualization and implementation of many energy-related laws and programs such as the Renewables Energy Act and strategies and operations of the blending of biofuels. In 2014-2019, he was designated as consultant for energy and the environment of Quezon City, where he proposed and advised for the establishment of the Quezon City Carbon Bank and the implementation of renewable energy products uh, projects sorry, to the city. He was also engaged by the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, or uh, UNICEF, as the national consultant in evaluating the Philippines Industrial Energy Efficiency Program. This became one of the bases in the implementation of the energy efficiency law in 2019. Last but not the least is Mr. Leon Steele. He has a master's degree in energy sciences and pursuing a PhD in energy policy. He is currently managing director of energy, New Energy Institute and manager education of Impact Hydrogen. From the start of his career, he has focused on conventional and renewable energy technology development, innovation, and education. He has held commercial roles in several energy companies and is a frequent speaker, author, and moderator at energy-related events. Furthermore, he worked for the Netherlands Organization for Applied Scientific Research as International Business Development Manager dedicated to enabling and accelerating the energy transition as well as General Mag Manager for the Energy Delta Institute. Mr. Steele holds three patents and several ancillary positions as Scientific Advisor of the Cur European Biogas Association, Sustainability Committee Member of the International Gas Union, and top author of Illuminem. Everyone, we would like to see a show of heart reacts to our three reactors for this Idecalog. Okay. Okay. So our moderator for today is Dr. Maria Lourdes Rebolida. Dr. Malu is a faculty member of the Development Academy of the Philippines. She was a full professor and former chairperson at the Department of Political Science at UP Diliman. Upon retirement, she continues to teach as professorial lecturer at the UP De Department of Political Science and National College of Public Administration and Governance. She earned her doctorate degree in public administration from NCPAG, UP, Diliman, and holds a master's and bachelor's degree in political science from the same university. She is a highly sought after research person, professor, and research advisor in the fields of public management, policy, and political science research. So to facilitate this part of our pro of our webinar, may we call on our moderator, Dr. Marie Malu Rebolida. Dr. Malu, the virtual floor is now yours. 
much. We, we welcome again all our 157 participants. We are very privileged to have with us a panel of reactors, experts in the field of energy. And we would like to start with our first reactor, Dr. Asser Javier. Dr. Javier, the floor is yours for your comments. Thank you very much uh, to our resource persons, uh, the Undersecretary Fuentebella, Mayor Manawag Mayor Jerry, Jeremy, and uh, all the other colleagues in the local governments who have presented as well, uh, including Director Patrick Aquino and Dr. Barcelona. Uh, and to all the LGUs officials who are present here, Thank you for empowering your communities towards energy efficiency. Uh, I will just have four points to uh, provide as part of my reaction. Number one is looking at the enabling opportunities for local government units as far as energy and renewable energies and other energy-related measures are concerned. Uh, if we look at, there are three point, three major points as far as enabling the opportunities are. Number one is looking at it from a revenue context and finance context. So uh, it is not only for the local governments that will have the savings, but the opportunity for markets to play as uh, at play as far as the income streams that can be generated from energy. So uh, as we all know, the national government agencies will have to rethink their position always in terms of expenditures of local governments because mandatory expenditures are too high already for local governments. For municipalities, it is already about 86% and about 76% for cities. So we have to rethink of uh, the various ways by which financing can be made to increase the revenue streams. Second is on capacity. The capacity of local governments varies across local governments. So a sweeping, sweeping policies across local governments should be rethought in terms of place-based strategies. I like the idea of Dr. Barcelona that uh, there are those whose, whose shape is already sculptured and does not need any more dieting because they are healthy. Quezon City is a good example of what uh, have been provided as far as the complexity of energy and climate change and all the interrelated agreements put into one local government. And then if we try to compare, say, for example, the Manawag experience of Mayor, of Mayor Jeremy, Mayor Jeremy Puba, I forgot. I'm sorry. Uh, so if we try to look at that, it will now, the basic and the complex now will now form as, the, 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 as two different extremes. No? So we have to look at that in that context, the individual and the institutional competencies of various local governments. And then third is legislation. How do we provide for a localization of legislation taking into consideration the different conditions by which the local governments are into? So we have to look at the economic, geographical, the institutional and individual capacities of local governments. And then lastly is looking at the enabling and regulatory localization of these policies uh, in terms of how effective they can be. The second main point that I would like to bring up is how national governments, particularly the Department of Energy, can be the enabling can provide the national enabling innovators tools. So in this particular case, the, the national government provides for beyond capacity development, the enabling of local governments across various local governments. Number one, like how can we provide building upgrades for engineers? Second is how can we provide uh, measuring and tracking energy use of local governments? So in this particular case, it is not just merely the local governments providing what are their plans, programs, etc. But the national government is shaping them towards a particular goal as provided for by the energy plan. And then looking at it from a funnel perspective, from the national commitments at the international level to the national energy plan to the local conservation plan. So how can these three 
big plants be integrated as one local energy plant. So these are some of the things that can provide for the national innovators tools, which can be provided for by national government. The third major point that I would like to raise is on the co-creation of col co collaborative continuums. Uh, as we all know, SDG 7, SDG 17, the Paris Agreement are all into are all put in place and need to be provided for a co-created space in the local governments. So how, how can that be done is a major issue for local government. Like, for example, how can we create budget neutral solutions because there are a large uh, national mandated expenditures already for local governments. Second, how can we integrate transportation, climate change, green accounting, and others that are necessary to make this as effective as possible. And then the last one is I congratulate the DOE in terms of how you are providing for incentives already as part of the SGLG, but I would like to look at it also beyond the SGLG by looking at the various individual and the institutional measures that have been done by local governments and what can incentives be done Say, for example, using Dr. Barcelona's framework, if I am already dieting, then what kind of incentives can I so that the others can also diet? So in this particular case, we provide for a like the flexible work arrangements, etc. If, if an LGU adopts a flexible working arrangements, how can national governments provide the kind of incentives for local governments to do that so that there will be energy savings instead of uh, pro, instead of policy guidance and regulation only by the Civil Service Commission. So in this particular case, government up there works together in shaping policies that will provide for incentives by the local for the local governments rather. So yun lang yung apat po na, na aking naiisip para magkaroon ng mahusay na energy efficiency put in place for local governments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Asser, for your very uh, insightful comments. Many things for our national government to think of as the enabling institution and for our local government units also to reconsider <clears throat> their investments and how they will transition lalo na itong darating nating um, the full devolution with the Mandanas ruling. Thank you very much, Dr. Javier. And our next reactor is engineer. Ma'am? Ma'am, with the permission of... Ma'am? Yes? With the permission of the engineer, just a quick uh, response para hindi tayo ma masyadong mawala para mabawasan. Is it okay? Uh, if uh, well, we were thinking if everyone could give their reactions after masyadong, the panel, but kung masadong matagal sigi po si Kim Sir Yusek uh, Quintabella, go ahead. Yeah, first of all, um, we have to focus on the LGU Energy Code, that is Joint Memorandum Circular, uh, that was signed in 2020. So what does it say? Um, titingnan po natin na dalawang plano, no? Dalawa yung plano para sa um, na sinasabit ng LGUs. Una, yung spatial plan or yung comprehensive land use plan. Pangalawa, yung comprehensive development plan. Yung unang plano answers the question where. The second plan answers the question how much. So, mm -hmm. doon sa LGU Energy Code, ang sinasabi doon, ilagay sa spatial plan ang entire energy supply chain para makita natin kung saan tayo pwedeng kumita. Kasi yung gamit natin ng energy sources sa ating jurisdiction, nandun dapat yung nakalocate. Meron ka bang source ng nat gas, petroleum, coal? Meron ka bang source ng solar, hydro, wind, biomass, and the like? So these are already incentives in a way with just proper planning and identification. The second one is how much, no? the comprehensive development plan. 
lahat ng pwedeng kitain from the energy <coughs> sector, nariyan din. Kasi kung merong planta sa loob ng jurisdiction ng isang um, LGU, meron kang share na 1 centavo per kilowatt hour na pwedeng mapunta sa host community na pwedeng gamitin pang ospital, pwedeng gamitin pang skwelahan, pwedeng gamitin environmental, pwedeng gamitin for electrification. And the example there is Batangas, na kung saan maraming power plant doon, umaabot ng 1 billion yung nakukuha nila na mga share. So those are already incentives that are in play. Now, um, the entire supply chain does not only look for fuel. Nasabi ko nga kanina, is the uh, um, coal, uh, not gas, petroleum, or biomass, geothermal, solar, hydro, ocean, wind. Titingnan din natin nasaan yung mga gasolinahan, nasaan yung mga wires para masiguro na kung may papasok pang planta sa loob or maglalagay pa ng solar panel sa bubong tulad ng Quezon City <coughs> na hindi niya na ma-maximize yung lahat ng bubong niya na pwedeng lagyan ng solar panels, e eh sayang yung income. Tapos bago tayo dumating sa energy efficiency and conservation na tinutukan namin sa usapin na to. But we cannot lose sight of the overall planning that should be integrated. And it's already written how you will do it, how we will all do it. So it's the LGU Energy Code 01, <coughs> uh, 06-001, signed by in 2020 by Sec Anyo and Secretary Kusi. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, thank you very much. You said um, 20 Bella. That was a very quick uh, response to the reaction of um, Dr. Javier. We already have a conversation going, but we need to allow the panel to also elaborate and give their comments. Please hold on to your questions and definitely we will be able to address that shortly after. Uh, engineer JJ Gonzalez, we have you next. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Salahan. May, may, may. Uh, good afternoon, uh, USEC, UP, Director uh, Patrick, uh, Dr. Barcelona, and uh, Dr. Asher. Okay, I'll talk about energy security. When we talk of energy security, it's, it's not only about uh, the supply and the demand. <clears throat> Maybe we can look also at the cost and the effect of it. Okay, go. next slide. <clears throat> okay, this is just a review of what's, uh, what is the green of the effect. I remember this framework. It was actually part of our board exam in chemical engineering in 1991. It was so 32 years ago, we were discussing already about this, but it's quite a far uh, diagram that we cannot really imagine. Now we are actually experiencing it. Now. Just, just to <clears throat> give a detail on this, the the, the cloud that uh, covers our earth, no, uh, the, 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 the white uh, circular uh, figure there actually is the, or the carbon, the greenhouse gas emissions. The more the thicker that we have, uh, the more becomes our earth becomes warmer, no, because one, uh, I can show it here. Okay. All right. So what's happening is that okay, the sun's uh, the, okay. The sun's rays get inside our atmosphere, but also within our earth. Also, we have our uh, our activities now coming from our uh, power generation, transportation. So we generate heat also inside the earth. So the thicker the cloud would be, and the more activity that we have on earth the warmer becomes our planet. No, so somehow we are, 30 years ago, when we talk of the ambient temperature, we're just talking about 27 degrees right now. We're not even experiencing it. No? Parang normal na yung 29 degrees centigrade. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> okay, this is just a slice of life. I took a, pic uh, I took a picture of the temperature and the uh, heat index uh, in May 9. <clears throat> it was uh, around uh, 1 p.m. The temperature was about 34 degrees centigrade and the heat index actually hit 46 degrees centigrade. No? And uh, again, our body temperature is only 37 degrees. So if we hit higher than that or even 39 degrees, 
we already we are already feverish. So what happens? The heat index is even higher than what is our body oh. temperature. So our body becomes now the sink of heat. Tayo na recipient ng heat. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> An hour after, because of that heat index, we were so lucky also that rain fell. I took this picture in UP Diliman. So it, it, the rain was about 30 minutes, very fast. No? But the next slide would show. Just 30 minutes of rain, the heat index, if you can see it, it's only 36 degrees now, from 46 degrees centigrade two hours ago. Oh, James. Then the temperature has gone down <clears throat> to around 29, 30 degrees. So what, what, does this, what does this mean? The heat index is a local observation because immediately the temperature has gone down. So meaning it, locally, we can do uh, <clears throat> mitigation and intervention to lower the, to lower the, the temperature. But it is a play of human activity and, of course, nature. We were so lucky that the rain fell. <clears throat> All right? So next slide. Okay. So what does heat index mean? <clears throat> so example, this is our body. Here, normal temperature, we have this, uh, the orange on the left side. But if we break the, <clears throat> the heat index, uh, which is, again, our no normal temperature is 37 degrees centigrade, if the heat index is higher than our normal body temperature, we need to have cooling. So our natural uh, <clears throat> tendency is for us to perspire. Mm -hmm. But if we don't have it, I mean, if we are so exhausted, exhausted already, we need cooling. So the more cooling we need, the more energy that will be required. So, mm -hmm. so <clears throat> at that time in May 9, uh, of course, expected demand for electricity will be higher. No? So mm -hmm. That's why even in those months, I mean, at least this May, our demand for electricity has really gone up. And some parts of the country, we have experienced the outages. So what happens now if we hit the, the higher heat index level? So it may become actually an emergency, especially for those who are vulnerable. The ones, I mean, those who are really sick already, or those who are suffering some sickness, or even maybe age, those who are in 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 aging uh, aging sector already, but what also is really important is that our poor sector, they cannot really afford you not know, just to cool their houses. For one, the houses are not made to have air conditioning system, but also the price of electricity is quite high. So another effect also is that okay, <clears throat> once we are dehydrated, there'll be need for medicine. We'll be needing more food also. So. This heat index means a lot to us. If we are so lucky, la, we are so lucky that just recently we have rain. In fact, we are expecting mm -hmm. some typhoons. But what about what if we'll be having extended uh, higher heat index uh, scenarios? Because we're expecting also the El Nino right now. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to really. I mean, this is a call also to, for action for local government that we can also we can do our part, but. Nationally, we really have to do something in our energy transition. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> okay, these are some <clears throat> snapshots of the outages or even MFDA recognizes that we have to impose the heat stroke break even. Because imagine our, our traffic enforcers exposed to the heat of the sun, direct heat of the sun. So they are vulnerable to heat stroke also. Next slide. These are the outages uh, <clears throat> issued by Meralco. So it's 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 becoming more open. Okay, next slide. Okay, so this is the carbon bank that we're expecting uh, that we capture this uh, emission that eventually will be. I think no one's still doing this. We have to have that carbon bank. Okay, next slide. Okay, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I have a picture. I should have. Okay, thank, <laughs> thank you, you. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much, uh, Engineer JJ, for for short. That uh, tells us that. With all these heat issues rising up, we will need technology to be able to provide alternatives to using our current uh, energy system to cool ourselves, not only in the month of May, but in the next months of this year. Thank you very much, our, uh, Engineer JJ. And now we have from our panel, architect Abraham Raponson Jr. Nope. 
uh, uh, Mr. Leon Steele, Mr. <laughs> Leon Steele uh, out there. Uh, you are in another country right now. It's yeah, evening there. That's true. <laughs> morning here. So we yes, just, morning yeah. here and afternoon with you guys. Yes. Yeah. Welcome to our panel. We will hear from you. you now, Mr. Steele. Yeah. Thank you very much for having me here, for inviting me here. Uh, I am from the Netherlands, actually, but I'm currently in South Africa because I did another project on hydrogen. Mm -hmm. uh, so I hope uh, the internet will uh, continue to work out because they will also have challenges here with stability of the grid. Um, just to give you an idea and maybe to respond to what's going on here, I think it's great that uh, to see that indeed in the Philippines, uh, especially, there's already so much development going on. Um, it's definitely a good idea to uh, to position yourself and to position the whole um, um, development agenda based on you know energy efficiency, trying to get get the most out of the energy system as it is now, and of course working on the transition. The transition being uh, very much um, the, depending on where you are. Uh, so in the mm -hmm. Philippines is, of course, a different type of country than, for example, the Netherlands where I live. So it really much depends on what type of in innovation and what type of uh, system uh, you already have. I would like to highlight a little bit more that if you are uh, looking at the complete transition, if you require all these different technologies and all the different ways of, of, of transitioning, uh, that you also need people uh, to be able to understand this and that you also need people to be able to install it and to develop it and to innovate. And that's something that we are personally working on a lot, uh, similar to, for example, a country like I am now in South Africa uh, is also an emerging economy, just like the Philippines. And then you are working on, instead of trying to import technology only, you know, and then somebody else in installing it for you, uh, you can also develop yourself. You can develop your own uh, uh, innovation technology landscape uh, to be able to really uh, work on uh, a, a good just transition. Uh, we have several things like, for example, hydrogen. If you look at, first will be energy efficiency, solar paneling, things like that. But on the second part, especially in a country like the Philippines, which is quite remote in a lot of places, things like ammonia, green ammonia and green hydrogen can also definitely be an option to consider to decarbonize some of the heavy industries and other uh, aspects of the transportation, for example. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, we have a, a hydrogen platform that we're going to launch where everybody uh, from every background can uh, be educated on different hydrogen aspects of what does it mean in the energy transition? How can you uh, work on that? Uh, and what does it mean for yourself or for your company or uh, for your development? So these things, just a few examples of trying to figure out, okay, how can we educate people as much as possible from all aspects of life, from all socioeconomic states, uh, but also really focus on the more practical side of things. How are you going to install these things? How are you going to maintain them? How are you going to do technology development, et cetera? So I think that's very good to do. And I'm glad to see that also with the speakers today, that it is very much about this development pathway as well. And uh, I think that's, that's excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we, we are being encouraged to develop educational schemes that will encourage creativity and innovation with whatever is going on right now with our climate and issues of uh, sustainability of our environment. We need more ideas. We need to yeah. see what are the alternatives to the current energy system that we have. Thank you very much to our panel of reactors. We heard Dr. Aser Javier and we had a brief comment already from uh, Mr. Fuentabella very, very quickly telling us that the uh, national framework and the local frameworks can be sources of ideas on how to enable local government units. We would like to open the floor for other questions and comments from our 147 now of participants in our platform. Some of you already sent in your questions and I'd like to read three at a time so that our panel of speakers and our panel of reactors can uh, say, give their feedback on the first three questions. And once that's done, we will go again to the next three questions. Uh, here's one that called attention to the challenges on the implementation of energy efficiency at uh, the, the local level. 
So some of these challenges were mentioned by our speakers and also by our reactors, particularly in terms of capacity building, enabling local governments. But um, our speakers might have um, other ideas or other emphasis on challenges that may enlighten our participants. Any one of our uh, speakers and panel of reactors for what challenges are going to be encountered by the local government units when they transition to more efficient um, energy systems and also energy conservation. Dr. Dr. Rick, you mentioned earlier mm -hmm. that challenges of investments and decision making, maybe you might want to elaborate on that. Okay, let, let me uh, let me uh, tackle that question in the following way. Yeah. So going back to the uh, to the dieting uh, as an analogy, yeah. Oftentimes, we tend to look at things with a bl very blinkered view. Yeah. So, for example, if we're trying to uh, transition, say three thousand local government agencies or local government units from their present practice into something that is, uh, shall we say, considered to be an energy efficient type of system. And some of the uh, local governments have already shown that. It becomes a very daunting challenge to look at, yeah? To tackle, to start with, yeah? In fact, uh, it is very tempting to say, I give up. Raise mm -hmm. hands, and that's the end of the story. Yeah, so it's, it's pretty much like, somebody who's probably weighing 200 kilograms and who aspires to achieve an ideal weight of 70 kilograms, yeah? Mm -hmm. So losing 130 kilograms would be a very daunting challenge. But if you start with small steps, very specific changes in one's behavior, then it can be, it can be done, yeah? So that's where I'm... That's where I'm leading to in looking at piloting, piloting mm -hmm. some of these uh, LGUs uh, who has already done some very good work on the uh, energy efficiency side and take that as an opportunity to learn lessons. Yeah. So an example would be, can we learn something from Manawa? Can we learn something from Quezon City? Can we learn something from Mandaluyong? Yeah. And what are some of those lessons that are applicable yeah, to a specific uh, LGU who is interested to learn from, from any of these uh, uh, three LGUs that I mentioned? So first step would be pick up the phone, call up the mayor and say, mayor, can I come and visit? Let's have a conversation over coffee. Yeah, mm -hmm. And the result of that conversation would be, okay, these are probably the the two or three things that can already implement in my own area. Okay. And after that, you learn, you validate, and you move on to the next stage, yeah? So, so the long and short of it is the energy efficiency is not only a question of changing light bulbs, changing air conditioning, mm -hmm. that is the first step. The second step is to widen the circle and say, what is the configuration in which you are operating under? So that becomes community-based. And from the community base, you move into the concept of smart cities. Mm -hmm. And smart city has to do with how you organize your cities, how you organize your communities, and how you use your energy and how you deliver the energy or satisfy the energy needs of your community. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Rick. You mentioned the need for piloting, and the, here we already introduced three local government units with what we may want to say as best practices. And our participants here may really want to follow up on them. And as uh, Dr. Rick has said, can we come over for a study visit and learn from how they were able to start from the beginning to the end? Earlier, I mentioned um, our um, architect here, Abraham Raponson, as I was probably very <laughs> eager to jump onto him to ask him uh, what, were, what are the challenges for a uh, local government to start 
from the from the very beginning because it looks like from the experience of uh, our LG in Mandaluyong, they've been doing this even before the uh, Energy Efficiency and con con uh, Conservation Act was legislated. If I'm right, um, in, in architect, you started this in 2012. Also, as he was talking, 2012, and the law was passed in 2019. So you have that learning curve that that, that this uh, LGU can share with everyone. The uh, uh, architect also mentioned that now, though, as a way forward, they will revisit. So they are now in the stage of revisiting. As uh, Dr. Rick mentioned, they are in the stage of reformulating, reconfiguring. So that's their stage now. But what about those that are going to begin the first step? So perhaps we can ask a little bit from Mandaluyong, what did you do in 2012 that uh, that was the first baby step towards uh, instituting energy efficiency and conservation in your in your city? Maybe maybe have you say something on this point. Uh, thank you for the for this uh, sharing. Uh, yung Mandaluyong po noong 2012 bag po nagkaroon ng Yolanda. Uh, yung aming mayor din, si Secretary Benor Abalos, ang aming green building champion. Wherein yung mainstream niya yung lahat ng mga efficiency at mga initiative ng city. Kaya po napili po yung LGU of Mandalu yung na maging pilot ng uh, green building ordinance. Mm -hmm. So as per implementation of 2014 onwards, uh, nakita namin yung, ordina yung introductory uh, ordinance ng 2014 ay isang baby step. para yung yung mga measure na magkakaroon ng ng epekto sa pag-implement ng energy efficiency ay uh, madaling uh, maangkop at ma-walk through yung mga gaps or opportunities na na-encounter namin sa pag-implement. Kaya yung advocacy ng Mandaluyong ay patuloy naming improve at at nagkagawa kami ng version 2 na wherein yung yung experience ng version 1 ng 2014 ang naging improvement sa version 2 ng Green Building Ordinance ng 2018. Mm -hmm. Pero hindi pa rin kami natatapos dahil may mga implementation experience kami na na-encounter on-site at sa pag-implement sa pag-implement ng mga projects ng mga private developers at well as yung mga project ng government at nakita namin na mayroon pang room for improvements na ma-maximize yung mga green building efficiency at ma-measure po. So yung advocacy po ng Mandaluyong sa lahat ng mga LGU sa buong Pilipinas Uh, sinishare namin ito sa benchmarking ng lahat ng LGU na gustong aralin ang aming experience at open namin binibigay itong uh, learning experience na magiging uh, maiwasan nila yung kanilang magkaroon ng uh, greater improvements sa pag-implement ng Green Building Ordinance. Although sinabi ko nga, ang uh, implementation namin ng RA 11285 ay hindi pa nag-take off dahil uh, nung pandemic na, na antala siya, Pero nakaprograma na sa susod na taon hanggang tuwing, bago mag-2027, uh, ma-implement namin. Lahat ng activities at initiative ng city ay nakaprograma na naka-align dun sa energy conservation law. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Architect. We have here Director Patrick Aquino who was speaking earlier about the highlights of the law. And if, if I'm not mistaken, I heard you mention renewables. Kailangan mag-develop ng renewable energy technologies and be able to mainstream that across the different LGUs. There's a question here on how can the law on renewable energy be effectively undertaken at the LGU level? So with regards to that question and Dr. Uh, Director Patrick Aquino's comment, perhaps we can also hear something from our uh, LGU in um, Quezon City. You've been doing solar panels, you've been doing your tricycles, street lighting. Uh, how would you advise or uh, respond to this question? What, what first steps would an LGU take to be able to bring renewable energies down to their constituency? Uh, good afternoon. Yes, sir. I, I, I think, ma'am, um, uh, first is um, educate them on the ano um mga technologies regarding um renewable energies and yung energy efficiency po kailan natin silang educate muna and ipakita natin ano ba yung effect nito sa magiging daily life ng mga constituents natin parang yun lang po so you cannot institute changes or ordinances at the community level without 
orienting them and giving them yes. uh, community education. I think that is also what Leon mentioned a while ago. You need to educate them uh, at, across all levels, uh, socioeconomic levels, educational yep. levels, so that this can be really uh, mind uh, changing and uh, you know behavior transforming. Um, our Dr. Mayor from Manawag, um, maybe you can share with us how do we orient our people? How do we, uh, re in, in fact, you said you were given a, an e-bus or you were, you know, a, a bus company uh, came in to help you. Maybe you can share a little bit so our uh, other LGUs can also bring in other partners, you not know, like the private sector in your locality, to be able to contribute to uh, this um, life-changing uh, system. Uh, Mayor? Thank you, thank you, ma'am. Uh, again, good afternoon to everybody. Well, uh, uh, we are a first-class community, but uh, we're still uh, practically uh, agricultural. And uh, though we are a pilgrimage town, but, uh, we notice, I, I agree with the contention and statement of Engineer Gaman that education is important. But uh, after instilling education, we need discipline. So we need to instill discipline to our people. And uh, we have started that. In fact, uh, next challenge after the discipline may be funding, funding requirements for the transition from, uh, of course, the conventional to the LED, among others. So uh, they, they, this should be sustained. It cannot be just uh, a good in a way, but it should be sustained. Uh, there should be uh, uh, somebody who will be a, a certain, uh, well, uh, a focal person who can uh, who can uh, focus on this uh, campaign for uh, for this transition to and conservation effort to local government and uh, we're we have started we're doing our effort to towards that and uh, you made mention of the bus it's not electric but uh, it's uh, it's a donation coming from uh, a big bus company which now helping us out. To, uh, to, uh, to ferry our employees and our people as a group, not on an individual vehicles, but on a big bus, which can uh, definitely reduce the consumption of, uh, of uh, diesel and uh, uh, gasoline for, for a certain uh, activity. Yes. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Mayor. So it's not yet uh, an electric bus, but having many employees in one bus can already be a step towards uh, reducing energy you know, instead of having each one of them go on on their own That's uh, earlier we had our uh, reactor uh we had um, dr Asher javier mentioned that the doe might be the enabling institution and we also had sec contabella mentioning that uh, local government units can look at the spatial plan and the comprehensive plan at the local government level. But talking about capacity building, uh, if you say, uh, uh, is still with us uh, on the floor, how can the DOE uh, bring about this uh, cultural, this uh, social aspect of transitioning to the new energy efficient and uh, conservation related system? Uh, how is the DOE uh, working with CHED? and uh, maybe even with uh, TESDA and other educational institutions to bring, to bring about this uh, social and uh, cultural and mind-changing uh, uh, initiatives. Yeah. Uh, Thank you very much, ma'am, for the question. And to the panelists, to the mayors, the LGUs, again, good afternoon. Um, the LGU Energy Code also provides there that you just have to call us if you want information education campaigns in the local government units. But um, kasi yung parang Biblia natin, yung magiging Bible natin, is si LG Energy Code. Hindi siya kasi one size fits all. Meron kakaiba sa isang LGU na halimbawa marami siyang waterfalls mm -hmm. at meron kakaiba din sa isang syudad kung ano yung didiskartehan natin for us to have the benefits of maximizing our energy resources and our energy utilization, how it maximizes yung benefits for the consumers. So number one is, <clears throat> aside from LG Energy Code, that's all there, kung ano yung guidance, meron nga pa yung, meron pa po yung draft na ordinansa na pwedeng ipasa ng LGU. Pangalawa, 
ang ginagawa ng Department of Energy is we just arouse, you know, we 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 uh, inform the local government units na may benepisyo at meron ding punishment actually. Mm. Kasi yung ease of yung energy virtual one-stop shop, pag may nag-apply na uh, business permit or may nag-apply siya na uh, permit sa isang local government unit at hindi siya na-actionan, within 15 calendar days po siya, hindi po siya working days. Pwede siyang masuspend yung mga nag-evaluate. Pwede masuspend one month, pwede three months. Pwede ma-remove from the, sa pwesto sa third offense na pwede matanggal ng benepisyo at perpetual disqualification. So, kaya ayaw nating malaman ng LGU na ganun lang yun. Sinama na namin sa LGU Energy Code yung mga benefits. So, once you know that already, ang hinihingi na natin is sino yung energy officer dito sa LGU. Kasi siya yung magsispecialize na itetrain natin. Siya rin yung magkikwento sa atin kung ano yung peculiarities ng isang LGU. Tapos, once na ma- ma- makuha natin si energy officer, siya rin yung pwede mag-introduce kung pa- paano natin i-organize yung step-by-step implementation natin. From energy resource identification to energy uh, services 24-7 and energy efficiency. Sino naman na magiging ano niya, mga assistant niya dito at paano nila susukatin yung mga benefits. So, it's uh, then once we are organized, doon na po natin imumobilize sila. Ano yung measurements? So, in two weeks, we are going to finalize the 2050 calculator kasi meron tayong sukat kung ano yung GHG emission um, doon naman sa pag-react kay, kay engineer yung sinabi niya about greenhouse gas emissions and the like. So yung level 1 natin is business as usual. Ibig sabihin, yung calculator na ito, kung wala tayong gagawin, level 1 yan, sukat natin yung GHG emission natin. Pag tinupad natin yung nationally determined contribution natin, level 2 yon Makikita natin kung anong pwedeng gawin. Nagpalit ng refrigerator, nagpalit ng mga LED lights, yung isa. Ano yung magiging impact? Level 2 yon Tapos level 4, yun yung pinaka uh, technically feasible pero very costly. So, nandoon yung tool na yan, the Philippine Emissions Pathway uh, Calculator. If a finalize lang natin yan na nag-undergo lang siya ng complete staff work, tapos na po siya. Uh, complete staff work with the Climate Change Commission, the NRDA, lahat. So, yun po, pwedeng ilaruin ng energy officers natin sa LGU. Kung ano yung greenhouse gas emission pag ito yung ginawa namin sa LGU. So, meron ding strategy kasi dun sa pangalawa sa isang tao niya, halimbawa, dun nga sa 24-7, na may benepisyo. Ano naman yung pwedeng mga income? At paano ito papaikutin? Considering na may bandanas ruling nga tayo na pwedeng gamitin na kapital. Yes. So, yung mga LGUs na meron ng mga power plants sa loob ng uh, jurisdiction nila, they already know the benefits okay. of energy regulation 1-94 and how to utilize it at mas mapalaki, yun po ang kailang strategize and ipasok lang sa dalawang plan, spatial plan and development plan. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. So I hope that enlightens our LGU participants na th- that you can um, bring in and integrate your initiatives for energy efficiency and con- conservation into the two local government documents no and that will uh, enable you to to mainstream but i know marami pa pong dapat matutunan i would just like to go through some of the questions very briefly in the interest of time as we can we are also about to close our webinar uh, the speakers and our reactors may give a very very short comment as you may want to desire these are some of the questions that they would like to know. Maybe it may be tackled not only in this webinar, but the agencies may want to pursue this on their own. So here you have a question on what are the alternative methods and sources of energy? What are the challenges uh, of energy efficiency at the local level? I think we answered that a little bit uh, earlier. Then uh, there's also a question about carbon footprint. How about heat 
foot, footprint. Can we also do some measurement on that? And there's also a question for how can you make electricity uh, afford, affordable, the price of electricity affordable if you're going to put uh, renewable energy uh, uh, technologies there? Then there's also a question on what about waste to energy equipment uh, that uh, may be also a part of uh, doing this energy conservation and energy efficient efficiency in initiative at the local level. At the um, chat box, we also have some questions here. Uh, let me see, I'm trying to look at my chat box. There's a question here. chat box. There's a question in the, in the chat box a while ago. I unfortunately have to go for another meeting, yes. but I thank you very much for this discussion and I hope you guys to see you soon and please continue thank without you. me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. So my my um, computer doesn't want to show, show the question in the chat box, but okay, anyhow, here, this one here, how about the, the submission of monthly uh, reports? So these, I think, are some operational uh, questions coming from our participants. So in the interest of time, maybe the, the speakers and our panel of reactors, you may want to give a sentence or two to some of these questions that we have randomly collected from our uh, res registered participants. Yeah, um, if I can go first, because I also have a meeting with the embassy. Um, uh, yes, sir, num yes. Like number one, um, it's, it's very practical. Energy utilization is very practical because energy cannot be created. It can only be transformed from one form to another. So we just have to identify where it is, where's the source, how do we use it? And utilizing it or making an example of a simple house, no? mm -hmm. um, it depends po kasi kung ano yung gamit ng appliances sa bahay. Una, yung mga, air, uh, yung mga TV na de cajon, that is malakas po sa kuryente. So, mas maganda flat screen. Ang savings nyo po doon, umaabot ng uh, 80, 80%. Yung mga mabili, mahilig bumili ng desktop, kung nag-laptop po tayo, 50% na po yung savings. Pag ano, pag uh, nandito na tayo sa, ano, sa cellphone, 90% na po yung savings nyo, kung kaya rin lang naman pala. So, from appliances, to discipline, to putting up RE, to putting up ICT, information communication technology. It makes life very simple and very practical. Kaya lang ang cost advance, yung beneficio after. So yung operations expense bumababa, yung capital expense tumataas. So pag naglagay ako ng solar panel sa bubong, kailangan inaral ko kung maraming tao sa bahay during daytime. Kung naglagay ako ng inverter sa aircon, aircon sa kwarto ko, dapat madalas ginagamit yung aircon na yun. Kasi kung guest house lang naman, kung guest room lang naman yun, wag na. So yun po, pinapalaki lang natin to a mall, to a building, paano na maximize yung ilaw, yung paano na maximize na hindi lumalabas yung damig. At pinapalaki lang sa isang munisipyo kung paano yun papatakbuhin. So yun lang po yung pinaka-practical tips from the DOE. How to bring costs down, there should be very practical solutions as cost-benefit analysis. And then like, especially that when we use RE, when we use ICT and energy efficiency to our current practice, kailangan po talaga naging uh, very engineer-like tayo para hindi masayang yung bitaw natin ng adding resources. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yusek, for your comments. We can have a round of our speakers and our reactors if you would want to respond to these random questions. There's one word that uh, is added in the chat box. Is there a base here for the gas uh, uh, C C G H G inventory? So th this these are some of the uh, basic questions that are being asked uh, from, from the panel. So please feel free to respond to any one of those that have already yeah. been mentioned. Ma'am, paalam na ako ha, nandiyan si Director Patrick. Thank you. Ah, Director Patrick. Um, yeah, for Director the Patrick, then we uh, we have the others also in the, in the, the, maybe a few seconds that you may want to respond. Yeah, quickly lang. For the system, there's a, a website, gmp.doe.gov.ph for the government energy management related reportorial concerns. You can visit that. 
Uh, if there are concerns, uh, you can send us an email. I keep in the email in the chat box. On the GHG inventory base from recollections, it, it's 2014 for the energy sector. Each sector like transport, uh, agriculture would have their own base year. Uh, right now for the energy sector, it's 2014. The computation uh, is provided in our website. Uh, and then as message, uh, as our uh, Yusek uh, Fuentebilla mentioned, uh, there's a lot of things that we can do. And we look to partner with the DAP as well as our local government units to provide you with the necessary tools. Uh, while the resources with the Mandanas Garcia has been shifted to you, we also are mindful that it remains to be challenging. Uh, rest assured that the DOE along with our private sector partners will find uh, and look for innovative ways of uh, helping our LGU partners uh, attain their sustainability objectives. So uh, again, marami pong salamat. Thank you very much. So for the LGU participants here and the, uh, our other co-learners, students in the graduate programs, if you have so many questions to ask, the DOE websites are uh, open for, for your queries. And we also have the uh, LGUs represented here. They have mentioned that they are open to you calling on them. And we have our consultants here, Dr. Javier. We have uh, engineer JJ Gonzalez. Mr. Leon Steele has already begged off as he's gabi po sa kanila doon. Maybe he has to sleep already while it's daytime here. You may want to have a few comments, um, Mr. JJ, engineer JJ. Any last uh, ideas for our participants? And also Dr. Javier. A few more before we close, yeah. Sir JJ. Okay, just to say, uh, there, there has been a project. Sir Jay, and sorry, yeah. uh, may we check your microphone, please? Yeah, yeah. Ayo, yeah. Back, back, back in 2018. Uh, echo? Okay. Echo. Okay, it's okay now, uh, sir. Yeah, back in 2018, DAP and DOE already have a project. Uh, we call it e power mo where there are around 50 municipalities that have joined already. So there are some best practices that are already actually in a book already. So maybe it can be used as a basis. The other one on the greenhouse gas, no, we, we tend to compute also, of course, rightfully so, we're computing the carbon footprint and the equivalent greenhouse gas emissions. But also, maybe next time, also maybe we have to look at the the heat capacities also that's being produced by, uh, by burning. Because I mean, it's practically the the carbon are coming really from combustion. So there is a heat capacity uh, equivalent also into that. That's why it contributes also to the heat index. All right. Okay. Thank you very, very much. Uh, any last comments, sir? Dr. Javier? When we talk of the local governments, we are talking here of autonomous partners. So and that means that there are Our geographic, economic, social, and various institutional considerations that we can be providing them. So, and then the second one is looking at it at the service delivery mandates of these local governments, looking at it from a compliance perspective, mm -hmm. looking yeah. at it, looking at it from a development management perspective. This all provides for the political and corporate umbrella policy of local governments. That can be a consideration for various interventions that Yes, nagahampu si Dr. Javier, but I was able to catch such yeah. as energy. Thank you very much. And I look forward to the success of our energy plan and energy code. Yes. 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 Thank you, Dr. Javier. We, you, we, were, we were able to catch up. Now? Yeah. We, at least we were able to catch up with some hmm. of the things that you are saying, especially that uh, there are many aspects to this, uh, financial, legal. Then you have the engineering aspects also mentioned by uh, uh, engineer JJ, and then you have also the governance issues at the local government level. And uh, in, in terms of Dr. Rick's perspective, 
you have to look at it really at all the dynamics of decision making, looking at different considerations. Uh, I will not anymore repeat the presentations or do um, very detailed summaries, but let me just put together what we have done this afternoon. First, uh, we would like to thank everyone for enlightening us on different aspects of the energy efficiency and conservation law. But of course, the four hours this afternoon is not enough for us to be able to understand all the ramifications. Although thank you, Director Patrick, that you summarized nuggets of these for us, just so we have some starting point. Number two, we have best practices from different local government units to start off. We are not on zero ground. And so um, we, what we need to do is to cascade to mainstream to have uh, the first batch of pilot uh, LGUs, those with experiences, and then you have the second batch, which will now be the emerging LGUs that will be trying to uh, implement this in their own constituency. And number three, there are many things to consider the full Mandana's ruling that will be put into effect in the next months. This will require national local government interface, interrelationship, and uh, from the DAP, we would like to call attention to multi-level governance. We would like to call attention to multi-sectoral, multi-stakeholders uh, governance. And uh, from the perspective of policy, even if we already have this law, we need to have policy coherence to be able to put together the different laws, no, may renewable energy, may solid waste management law, and pro green uh, procure procurement act, so uh, I think we can put our act together with business, with the civil society organizations, our national agencies to put policy coherence and apply them as needed in our respective localities according to need and circumstances and levels of capacity. Uh, may I now turn back the floor to uh, Ms. Cha for our closing part for our e decalogo de de decalogo decalogo <laughs> for for today may 22 miss cha doc malu thank you so much <laughs> so far we have some questions that we can email to our uh, attendees okay yes. so we've come to the last part of our program a huge thanks to all our resource speakers and reactors for sharing with us your valuable knowledge and insights about energy efficiency and conservation. To Dr. Malu for facilitating the exchanges of ideas. And of course, to our dear attendees who have joined and interacted with us today. Uh, at this juncture, the DAP Graduate School would like to award the Certificate of Appreciation to our resource speakers. The Certificate of Appreciation is presented to Yusef Felix William Minty Fuentebella for sharing his time and expertise as research speaker during the conduct of the e Decalogo webinar series entitled, entitled Empowering Your Community, How Local Government Can Lead the Way in Energy Efficiency and Conservation, conducted by the Academy's Graduate School of Public and Development Management, held on May 22, 20. 23 through Zoom, signed by Dr. Lizan Perante Kalina, Dean of DAP GSTD. Next, we have Dr. Ricardo G. Barcelona. Thank you, sir. We also have DOE EUMB Director Patrick T. Aquino. Thank you so much, Director. Okay. So we have our next Honorable Mayor Dr. Jeremy Ajerico Rosario. Thank you, sir. We have Engineer Arvin Argamad. Next, we have Architect Abraham Raposon Jr. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. We would also like to award the Certificate of Appreciation to our reactors. Thank you so much for sharing your time and expertise. Dr. Asher Javier. Thank you, Doc. Next, we have uh -huh, 
We have Engineer Job Jacob Gonzalez, MNSA. We also have Mr. Leon Steele. Okay. And of course, to Dr. Maria Lourdes Rebolida for a very engaging facilitation of the form. Thank you, Dr. Malu. Okay, so thank you very much to our esteemed resource speakers, reactors, and moderators. Again, to get your certificate of attendance to our webinar, kindly ensure to answer the evaluation form that we just sent via Zoom chat box right now. Okay, so of course, we cannot end this program without the traditional gallery photo session. May we ask uh, everyone, those who can, to please turn on your video cameras. We have, so far, we have 118 attendees. Earlier, we have max, uh, 168 attendees. So we have three frames. Please keep smiling as we take your pictures. Okay, so we have five. Thank you so much. Almost everyone is turning on their cameras. Okay, so first frame, five, four, three, two, one. Next frame. Four, three, two, one. And for our last frame, three, two, one. Okay, I think our team member um, was able to take all our pictures. So thank you for keeping your smiles for our group photo. Again, I am Chama Kiraya from the DAP Graduate School of Public and Development Management. Thank you so much for attending this webinar and have an empowering week ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much for those uh, asking regarding the evaluation link. Uh, please refresh now. Please, please refresh our evaluation link. Okay, I hope everyone can access now. Okay. Yeah, okay, please access. Okay na po. Okay, from Ma'am Crystal. Thank you so much. Please access. Okay, please uh, access our link right now. Thank you so much.
Nagigalap ako ba on? Sabi ko, just in case on the road na ako, eh, may merienda, hindi ko gano'n. 